we are happy to have you here. We're going to get started and just open up with worship. Are you, are you blessed this morning? Yes. Are you blessed this morning? Yes. Amen. Let's sing about it. Trouble knocking at my door today, ain't gonna let it in. Worry want to steal my joy away, ain't gonna let it win. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child yeah. of God. Oh, every day is a good day, and you're the reason why. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed, got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. By God, you, Lord, I'm so blessed. And when I count the problems that I see, hope looks all but gone. And when I count the ways you're good to me, you got me counting all day long. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. Got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. By God, you, Lord, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed, got this heartbeat in my chest, no it doesn't matter about the rest, if I got you Lord, I'm so blessed, on my best day, I'm a child of God, on my worst day, I'm a child of God, oh every day is a good day, and you're the reason why, sing it again, on my best day, I'm a child of God, on my worst day, I'm a child of God, oh, every day is a good day, and you're the reason why. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed, got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. By God, you, Lord, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed, got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. Sing it again. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. Amen. Woo! I'm blessed. Are you blessed? It's because I'm a child of God. And on my worst day, I'm still a child of God. That's right. <laughs> Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never. Sing it again. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. Yeah. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. In every war he wages, he will win. So I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know how this story ends. Yes! Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, 
for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Sing it again. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. One more time. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I want to read to you a scripture passage this morning. It's found in the book of Revelations. I taught you a new song last week, and I told you it was based on a scripture found in Revelations. Now, I'm going to read you what the scripture says. And as I do, if you want to close your eyes, you can. This is a vision that was given to John, and he was taken into heaven, right directly to the throne room of heaven. Now, imagine that. Imagine that. And this is what he saw. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. And the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings, day and night. They never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave honor and glory and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Worthy is the Lamb of God. All the saints and angels. All the 
saints and angels bow before your throne all the elders cast their crowns before the lamb of god and sing you are worthy worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory and angels bow before your throne holy elders cast their crowns before the lamb of god sing it out you are worthy you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory sing it again you're worthy of it all lord you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Sing it again, day and night. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing it again. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You're so worthy. You are worthy of it all, we worship For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Tell him again. You deserve the glory. Father, we just are so grateful to be in your house this morning, to worship you, to just spend time in your presence. Father, we thank you that you are the lamb, that you are the chosen one of God, that you are Messiah, Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, you are our God. We are your children. And this morning, we want to just press into you, to your Holy Spirit, and receive all that you have for us. So as we were open the word of God, may you speak truth to us. 
And Father, as our children go next door and they have a lesson prepared for them, I pray you would speak truth to them as well. Father, may you receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Let's sing that chorus one more time. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, worship team, you may be seated. I have some announcements. The first one is we have this lovely uh, Kirkland from Costco nativity set that Karen is giving away. It's in perfect condition. If you would like a nativity set, come claim it. Anybody need a nativity set? We'll bring it to you. You don't have to stand up. All right. It's here. If you need it, it's a nice one. This is one we have at our house. We love it. Uh, it's there for you. All right. Announcements. 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 <laughs> Goodwill shopping extravaganza. This Saturday. It's for women. However, the men can come too if they want. So we're going to hit two Goodwills and a Goodwill... Uh, What's that place? The bins. The bins. We're going to go to the bins. We're not going to have the bins. We're going to go to the bins. All right? Saturday, we're leaving here at 1030 if you want to go. Vacation Bible School is next week or the week after? It's coming up. There's a sign-up sheet back there. I think we already have like 12 or 13, 13 kids signed up. So if you want to come to Vacation Bible School, get signed up. Ages 4 to 12, you must be potty trained. Uh, 4.30 to 6, bring your bathing suit every day and a towel because you will get wet. Woo! All right, what else do we have? Tickets are now on sale. You can scan the QR code to buy your tickets today. It will take you to our website, and you can purchase your tickets there. I would not hesitate in buying your tickets because we sent out how many mailers this week? Over 200 mailers this week. There are only 200 seats available. So if you want a ticket, I'm saying buy it now because it's first come, first serve. After we hit 200, we will not sell any more tickets. So if you want to come, buy your ticket. All right. Children, it's time for Children's Church. If you would like to come help Jessica with the memory verse, you can come on the stage. Jessica Wheeler is going to push that pulpit over to the side. Uh, if you don't want to help with a memory verse, you can line up at the door. So you have two options, children. You can line up at the door, or you can come up on the stage. Yay! All right. We have some helpers, Jess? Yay! We got a couple more helpers. Okay, Jess, if you would like to, J Gavin, you want to put the motions up there? Okay, are you guys all ready? All right, Jess and kids, lead us in our memory verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Philippians 4, 4, yes. Very good. All right, Jesus. Lovies. Judy Sunshine's here, so the party can start. Woohoo! All right. Oh, it's a beautiful day. You feel the, the Holy Spirit here? I feel the Spirit moving. All right. 
Today we are going to wrap it up. That's it. Today is the final message in the book of Esther. It's been fun, and I've enjoyed every second of it. We're going to cover chapters, all of chapter 9 and the three verses in chapter 10 today. So, there's a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover. But before I begin, I want to start with a story. I want to start by telling you a story of a little town in Alabama that was able to turn a tragedy into a triumph. And it's not sports related. Right? Alabama and it's not sports related. This story involves, however, an invasive and debilitating insect from Mexico. It is called the bull, B-O-L-L, weevil. The bull weevil was first spotted in the United States in Texas, though no one knows exactly how it came across the border. It didn't have a passport, it just came in. Illegal. Although the bugs can fly only a short distance, they spread rapidly and their path of destruction has immediate <laughs> effects. <clears throat> in, the early in the 20th century, the early 1900s, the bull weevil infestation ravaged cotton production throughout the South, and it resulted in the loss of many cotton crops. Within five years of contact, the total cotton production declined over 50%. <clears throat> At the height of its infestation, it was down, it was 70%. Local economies were obviously devastated and land values plummeted. Like other places in the South, cotton was the main cash crop of a little town called Enterprise, Alabama. And in 1915, the bull weevil reached southeastern Alabama and more specifically, Enterprise. With the weevils now in their fields, farmers were getting smaller and smaller yields of cotton. And farmers could switch to other crops. They, I mean, surely could. Um, there were other crops that couldn't support the bull weevil. Cotton was the bull weevil's uh, plant of choice, that and flowers. But cotton generated the <laughs> highest profits, and it didn't take great land to grow you can have marginal land and grow great crops of cotton. But one of the few crops that could tolerate these conditions were peanuts! <laughs> peanuts! In 1916, after visiting North Carolina and Virginia where he saw peanuts being grown, a man named H.M. Sessions <clears throat> came back to Enterprise, Alabama with a bunch of peanut seeds. And he convinced a local farmer, C.W. Baston, this indebted farmer who was pretty much destitute at this point, to back his idea and try planting peanuts instead of cotton. With the first crop, the farmer was able to pay off all his debts. And I read more on this, paid off all his debts, paid for seeds for other farmers, and had $5,000 in 1915, 16. So I guess it doesn't take a genius to realize that he convinced other farmers to join him in peanut farming. More and more farmers decided to follow suit, and before long, bumper crops of peanuts began to repair the economy of this little town called Enterprise, aptly named Enterprise, Alabama. By 1919, the bull weevil scourge had reached its peak. 70% of crops just, just gone. But by that point, Enterprise had diversified its crops. In addition to peanuts and cotton, they got brave and they started growing potatoes and sugar, grain, sugar cane and sorghum and tobacco and all kinds of other crops. It was really thanks to the bull weevil that Enterprise diversified it all, which is why Enterprise erected a statue in honor of the bull weevil. 
You heard me correctly, my friends. In 1919, a monument was created in honor of the bull weevil. The monument depicts a female figure in a flowing gown with arms stretched above her head. She raises high a trophy topped by an enlarged scale of the bull weevil. The monument is a tribute to how something disastrous can be a catalyst for change. Did you hear that? It's a reminder of how the people of Enterprise adjusted in the face of adversity. The plaque in front of it reads the same today. It's still there. It reads the same today as it did back in 1919. It says, in profound appreciation of the bull weevil and what it has done as a herald of prosperity. This monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama, full stop, right? <laughs> what had almost been the instrument of their destruction became the source of their rejoicing. Sound familiar? Like the, this little town, the Jews in Esther's day in Persia had come close to being destroyed by their enemy. And over the past several weeks, we have seen how the evil Haman <laughs> had convinced the king to sign a law that threatened to bring about the destruction of all the Jews living throughout the empire, uh, the Persian Empire. Oh, bad? Okay, yeah, he is bad. Esther and the Jewish queen, Esther, who was the Jewish queen, uh, list, listened to the prompting of her cousin Mordecai and informed the king that the destruction of the Jews would mean her death too. At which time the king turned on his number one guy, who was who? Haman. The evil Haman. <laughs> and had him skewered on the 75-foot pole that Haman had constructed for Mordecai's execution. So the king then appointed Mordecai to fill the position that Haman had once held, second in command throughout the entire empire. So with Esther's help, the king's authority, and Mordecai's um, role now as second in command, they changed the destiny of the Jews. Now remember, he couldn't erase the old law that sentenced the Jews to death because you can't change the law, but he wrote a new law that allowed the Jews to defend themselves, to retaliate against anyone who attacked them and take the property of those who came against them, the defeated enemy. So celebrations last week were, were Together, celebrations were filling the streets of Susa. People were rejoicing that this new edict had been uh, sent out. And all the Jews and their friends were rejoicing and celebrating. And this tragedy that really could have ruined them, destroyed them, was turned into triumph. Now the reality is, each and every one of us in this room deals with tragedy at some point in our lives. It's how we deal with tragedy that determines whether or not it will destroy us or whether we'll gain victory over it. With that being said, we're going to see how the Jews took the possibility of victory, where we left them last week in chapter 8, and turned that possibility into a reality of victory in chapter 9. So we're, this is a lot of scripture today, so we're going to break it down into some bite-sized pieces. We're going to start by looking at verses 1 to 4 as we look at D-Day, right? It's, it's finally upon us. So let's look at verses 1 to 4. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had, a, had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the province, and he became more and more powerful. 
Now, nine months have passed since we were together last week. Nine months, and it feels like it, people. I missed you desperately. Now we jump forward to, to chapter nine. Nine months have gone by, and D-Day has finally arrived for the Jews. The day that everyone had been anticipating since Haman had first published the Jews' execution order 11 months prior. But Mordecai's degree had changed the D in D-Day from destruction to deliverance. At first, the Jews had been dreading this day, as you can imagine. But with the death of Haman, the installation of Mordecai, the support of the palace, the new edict that went out, giving them the right to defend themselves against anybody who would come after them, they felt confident about the outcome. Much had changed in the nine months since Haman's death. Look again at verses 3 and 4. This is interesting to me. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai, fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. Unlike the Garth Brooks song, the Jews had friends in high places, right? <laughs> and they knew it. And so did everyone else, according to this. The Jewish men were organized and they were armed. They were ready to meet any enemy who would attack them and their families. And they were ready to take on the battle that, that was coming for them. But the Lord had given them a greater weapon than their swords because the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, if I'm in a battle with someone and they're coming after me, I would love for the fear of the Lord to fall upon them. Yeah. Right? This was a fear that God had sent into the hearts of those enemies to keep them from fighting his people. The fear of God protects those who fear him and who believe in his promises. Because the Jews believed Mordecai's degree, decree, they had new courage. They weren't afraid anymore of the enemy. And their courage put fear into the hearts of the enemy, right? It's kind of like David and Goliath, right? You would think that David's going to lose the battle, but David had confidence. He's like, I don't need this armor. I don't need, I just give me a couple stones and a slingshot. There was another aspect to this fear that helped give the Jews their victory. And that was the people's fear, not of God, but of who? Mordecai. The princes, the deputies, the governors, the officers of the king throughout the empire were in such awe of Mordecai that they helped the Jews defend themselves against the Persians. Yeah, you could cheer for that. That's a good thing, right? Yay! Yay. There were two laws operating on D-Day, right? Remember, the first law couldn't be eradicated. So there's two laws, one opposing the Jews, you can go kill any Jew you want, or one in favor of the Jews, right? You can help defend the Jews. The officials could choose to follow either one, and they wouldn't be breaking any laws. They would be following the law. They could go after the Jews if they wanted. It would be perfectly legal. What tipped the balances in the favor of the Jews was that the officials were afraid of Mordecai. They had seen what his God had done. They had seen what his God could do for him, and they didn't want to mess with that. They were afraid of what the consequences might be if they, found, if they were found favoring the wrong side, going for the wrong team, cheering for the wrong people. God had given Mordecai his high position and his great reputation, and Mordecai used his authority to do the will of God. Now, remember, Haman was... <coughs> people were afraid of him, too but for the wrong reasons. The word was that whoever opposed Mordecai got shish kebobbed. <laughs> and they didn't want to get shish kebobbed. 
And the Jews went from being hunted people to being the favored people because of Esther and Mordecai. And those who had been mistreated, those who had been powerless to do anything about how they were treated, they now held all the power. And sometimes when people who are bullied or those who are marginalized get all the power, sometimes it doesn't turn out well, right? There are, there's a lot written about that. I could have gone on for a whole couple more pages about that. So let's look at verses 15 to 16 to see what they did with the power to destroy. Because that's what they held, right? They held the power to destroy. We're going to look at verses 15 to 16. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed, and uh, there's 10 names here. I'm not even going to try them. <laughs> if you want to try them and practice them at home today, you go right ahead. You can see them all there. They have a bunch of uh, con uh, you know, syllables and consonants and vowels in there. And I'm sure they make up a perfectly beautiful name. And so I don't want to destroy that perfectly beautiful name by trying to pronounce it, OK? Those, those 10 men, OK, they were killed. Where am I now? OK. The 10 sons of Haman, those beautiful names up there. The enemy of the Jews, they were killed. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The Jews did not take anything from them. Not their families, not their belongings, nothing. Verse 11. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the ten sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa, only in Susa, permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also. And let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 men but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. Now, it amazes me that even with all the support that they had from the king and the government officials, the satraps, all of them, there were still some that were so hateful and destructive that they still attacked the Jews on D-Day. But when they did, they were defeated. It's remarkable that so many Persians dared to attack the Jews right in the center of Susa, the king's own city, where both his wife <laughs> Esther and his first in command Mordecai lived. Since the Jews weren't the aggressors, it means that the ten sons of Haman had taken up arms against them. What this means is that the 75,000, the 500 the first day, the 300 the second day, all of them started it. The Jews didn't go, hmm, nanny, 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 come get me. No. They didn't instigate these people shot the first shot, okay? If you remember from last week, the law enacted by Mordecai in chapter 8 gave the Jews the right to kill not only the men who attacked them, but also their entire families, women and children included. But in this record of their victory over their enemies, the total of how many people died, there is no mention of any women or children. This could be because the total number of women and children were simply not counted, right? That happens in scripture. It's a normal practice of scripture 
to only include the men, like the feeding of the 5,000, that was just 5,000 men. Um, the population of the Jews who left Egypt, they only counted the men, not the women and the children. Another possible reason for not mentioning the deaths of women and children was because the Jews restrained themselves and only killed the men who attacked them. They only killed those who attacked them. And I believe that this second option is more likely of the two. I don't think women and children were killed on that day. I believe that this second option is the option. Here's why. Look at the last sentence in verse, uh, in verse 10. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The wife and the children were considered plunder. Then look at the end of verse 15. And they put to death in Susa 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Again, at the end of verse 16, they killed 75,000 of them, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Three times it's recorded and stated that the Jews didn't take any of the spoils. This was true of the Jews in the capital city as well as all 127 provinces throughout the kingdom. Obviously, the Jews had some kind of agreement amongst themselves. It spread throughout the entire provinces, 127 provinces, right? The law gave them the right to kill women and children and to take plunder for themselves, but they unanimously decided not to exercise their right. We're not going to do it. We have the right to do it, but we're not going to do it. Instead, they exercised mercy and self-control, and they deliberately restrained themselves from going any further than they needed to go. Their conscience didn't give them the same rights that the law did. If they had taken the plunder, then the families of the dead soldiers would have nothing to live on. So if they took everything that they owned, now the widow and the, and the orphans, they had nothing. So they didn't touch any of the plunder. They weren't out for wealth. They weren't even out for vengeance. They only wanted to protect themselves and defend their right to live safely in the empire. There was room for mercy, and guess what? They exercised it. But there was also room for justice. And we like reading about the mercy, but sometimes we get a little uncomfortable when it comes to the justice. Let's look at verses 11 to 15. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will be granted. And here's what she said. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also. And let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of that month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 more men. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. So the king received the report that Haman's ten sons, along with 500 other men in the city of Susa, have been killed. At this point, you might expect the king to say, okay, that's enough, right? You've had your fun. Let's not kill anybody else. But instead, he came to Esther, and he said to her those same words that he has said now three or four times, right? What is it that you wish? What do you want? I'm going to give it to you. What's your request? And she made two requests. First, she asked that the king allow the Jews to take a second day to finish the job that they had started in the capital city of Susa. Now, not in all the other 127 provinces, just in the capital of Susa. This is important. And second, she asked that Xerxes impel the now dead sons of Haman on poles. Now, Esther's response might surprise you. We like to think of Esther as quiet and demure and maybe even shy. She is none of that. 
As a matter of fact, some commentators have seen Esther's request in verses 12 and 13 as evidence of a vindictive spirit on her part. But this wasn't the case either. She's not shy and demure, but she's not vindictive either. You have to remember that Haman's strongest support was in the capital city of Susa. Where did she ask to go a second day? Susa. Susa. This is where all the people bowed down to him. And this is where all those who benefited from him lived. Right? They would get favors from him all the time. And since it would be easy for them to get together and plan a retaliation, Esther wanted to be sure that none of them would survive to cause further trouble. Now, it's even likely, commentators believe, that she received some private intel that there was a coup happening, that there was going to be a second day of attacks, that they had planned to attack again the next day, which is what prompted her to ask her husband for permission to extend the Jews' right not to go and find these enemies, but to simply defend themselves against them. And Haman's sons, they were already dead. I mean, you can't kill a dead person any more than they're already dead, right? So what's the point in hanging them on poles? It wouldn't hurt them anymore, but what's the point? Well, this action was a way of saying publicly what these men and their fathers stood for will never be allowed again. It was a way of preventing this from ever happening again so that no one else would have to die. In ancient days, in biblical times, the Romans, they would put poles along the roadways and they would impale people who had broken the law against the Romans on those poles. And the purpose was those people walking up and down that road, traveling to and fro, they would see these people and it would be a message to them, don't mess with the Romans. This was a message saying, don't mess with the God of Mordecai and Esther. Don't mess with him. Both mercy and justice were exercised on this D-Day. And at the end of the day, the enemies of the Jews had been defeated. How many Jews does it say were killed on D-Day? Zero. (laughs) Jews. Jews, 75,000 throughout the provinces, 800 in the capital city with the two days. It doesn't mention any Jews that died. That's to wipe it out. Hammer's lost to it twice. Twice. Every single person. Yep. So what do you do when you've defeated your enemies? You celebrate. Yeah, you go to Disneyland. No. You celebrate, you party. When all the killing was over, the Jews celebrated with a day of feasting because you cannot have a party without food. And the rest of this chapter tells us some of the details about this party. We're going to go through it because I think all scripture is important, right? And so we're going to read it. We're going to read verses 17 to 28. You ready? Ready. Hold your breath, here we go. (laughs) We're going to look at the victory celebration. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th, they rested and made it a day of feasting. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th. Remember the second day. And then on the 15th, they rested and made a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far (coughs) to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. He's like, you know what? Let's just celebrate both days. That's my kind of guy. Mm. 
as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrows was turned into joy and their mourning into the day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy, again, my guy, and giving presents, I love him, of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word pur, because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had, had happened to them. The Jews took it on themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should, without fail, observe these two days every year in March, in the way, still happening today, prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, and in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of those days die out among their descendants. Woo! Purim is still celebrated today, two days, the 14th and 15th of March. It is a celebration of food, of giving gifts to the poor, collecting food for the needy. It is just a, a, a celebration. And every time in that celebration, the evil Haman is mentioned, guess what they do? They boo! Now you know why I've been telling you to do that. You are celebrating Purim. That's what they do. When they say Haman, everyone goes, and when they say Mordecai, they go, and when they say Esther, they go, that's right. So these verses tell us several things about this victory celebration. The first thing we're told about the party is that it was celebrated on different days by rural, I hate saying that word, rural, say it, rural, rural. and by city folk, right? The, the country folk and the city folk, they celebrate on different days because the city people weren't done. They had to go an extra day. The Jews in the provinces finished their fighting on the 13th day, and so on the 14th day, they whooped it up. In the beginning, the Jews were united in their victory, but divided in their celebration. But in the end, they all came together and decided, let's just take two days to celebrate this victory. The second thing we know about this party is that it was called the Feast of Purim. And the name Purim, we know, comes from the pur or the lot that Haman cast. It's a, it originates from his um, way back when he first came up with the idea to eliminate the Jews. Um, the third thing that we know about this feast is that Mordecai stipulated a certain way to celebrate. And I love this about him. He said, eat food. Yeah. Yes. And give to the poor. Amen. Give gifts to each other, but don't forget the hurting. Look at the second part of verse 22. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. They were to give gifts of food to one another, making sure that no one forgot this day, but don't forget the needy. It stated that during these celebrations, the Jews went to the, the slain enemy's families and gave gifts of food and comfort and joy. In their joy, they were to pay attention to those who were hurting all around them and help them share in the joy. And I think that should be a message to us too, right? When we're enjoying life and having a good time, we need to remember to spread the joy. We need to recognize that even when you have cause to rejoice, I guarantee there's someone close at hand who is hurting. Pay attention to them and try to find ways to increase their joy. So let's look at chapter 10 and wrap this bad boy up. You ready? Chapter 10. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. And all, all his acts of power 
and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. He spoke up for the marginalized. This brief chapter tells us that Mordecai, unlike his predecessor Haman, used his office to serve the king and to help the Jews. Sometimes when people are elevated to high office, they forget their roots. They ignore the needs of the common people, but Mordecai wasn't like that. The last part of verse 3 tells us that Mordecai was distinguished among his people because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for them. This implies that there were still forces at work against them, against the, the Jews in the empire, opposing them and threatening them. But Mordecai, until he died, represented them in court, and he protected them. All throughout the book of Esther, we've clearly seen the hand of God at work in the lives of his people. Even though you can't see it, God is at work in your life. Amen. Even if you can't feel it, God is at work in your life. Amen. Even if you feel like your life is coming to an end, God is at work in your life. When things look hopeless, remember that God is sovereign. He is in control. And the same is true whether we're in good times or in bad times. No matter how hopeless our situation is or how much we'd like to give up, we need to remember that God is sovereign. And he has promised us in scripture, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I have started a work in you, and I will see it through to completion. Amen? Amen. Any comments, questions, or concerns? Gavin's running around with a microphone. Susan has something there. Jay, you want to go grab the other microphone and take it around to people? All you have to do is hand it to him. It's in the sound booth. Ben will give it to you. I have Thanks, two Jay. thoughts. Yes. One, one is about the the celebration and that they were casting lots. Yes. You know, we see the pictures of that little dreidel, the little thing that looks like a top. Yep, yep. And it, it never occurred to me that said they played games to celebrate, to pretend like they were casting lots. That's and that's it. what that's about. That little spinny top yeah. thing with the numbers, that's, ca that's a lot and it's a dreidel. They play with yeah. it on Purim. And that other thing is I've been reading Revelation and, and studying it. And um, the, the song about the let the incense arise. Yes. This is something I loved when I found it in Revelation yeah. is that an angel brings a golden bowl filled with the prayers of God's people and he holds it before him and he just I can just picture him holding it and letting that the incense of the prayers of his people rise around his face and he's Breathing savoring them and loving to receive our prayers. Mm -hmm. And that helps me when it's prayer time that I feel like I'm blessing him because he wants to, yeah. he's, he treasures those things. Okay. And it also says they go up forever, that he doesn't, the, the prayers go up forever. He doesn't just listen for that moment, but he holds our prayers forever. Amen. It's beautiful. Anyone else? <coughs> Oh, up here. So you just flip it from, there should be a mute button on it. Oh, okay. Here, let me see. Oh, um, it might be in the bottom. You just press and hold. There it is, green. Green go. Uh, just for clarification, yeah. Yeah, the edict did say that they can kill the women and children. And plunder. That was part of the plunder. Yeah, the, that was part Specific of the specifically yes. women and children. Yes. Okay, because I don't see that as being defensive. If they attacked, the, well, that's because it's part of the plunder. So, um, and back then, this back is. Back then, that's what they would. Yes. Women and children property was, was all kind of the same. All the same thing. It was right, their property. Right. It was a men's property. Right. And um, back then, when there was war like that, and you killed 
people off, you killed the entire, it was like cancer. You don't right. just take out a piece of the cancer, you take out the whole thing. Right. And so it was common, right. common. that yeah. when the enemy came against you, you would you kill them. Um, but that's my understanding of what the plunder is. It included right. the women and the children. Right. But the edict of Haman said you can kill men, women, and children. Right. Because of that time, though, that would be like Joshua. Yes. It's the same thing. Exact it's, it's, same thing. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if right. you. The, the, those are things I can Same people. A little bit it's with. the same people, you, too. And the, yeah. uh, yes. That, right. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, there's so much to say about that, but right. um, if in Mordecai's um, edict that he wrote, he said that they could kill women and right. children, but right. they didn't. Right. They did not do that. Right. Yeah. So okay. they chose not to. Yeah. Just because they could didn't mean they should. Right. That's a lesson for us too, right? Just right. because you can doesn't mean you should, right? All right. All right. What else? Anybody else? Not it? All right. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Love one another. Be good. Go get your kids. There's a lot of them.